We invite you to Shell Chateau, where your host is the world's outstanding entertainer, Al Jolson, with an old star bill of famous guest stars. We switch you now to Shell Chateau, where you'll be greeted by Al Jolson. Again, I welcome you to Shell Chateau, where each Saturday night we present a super vocal show consisting of the brightest stars from all branches of the entertainment world. Listen, I'm going to tell you who we have tonight. For music, we have Dixie Young and his orchestra. And when Dixie plays, people listen with their mouths wide open. <laughs> How else would they yawn? <laughs> Oh, you didn't get it right away. <clears throat> for song, for song, we have a little lady, Miss Alice Dawn. And what a sweet singer of song she is. The other day, I met Miss Dawn at a charity bazaar. And she was selling kisses for orphan babies. Very sweet of her, too. She was selling these kisses for 25 cents, 50 cents, and a dollar each. So I said, you like it, Miss Dawn. What is the difference? You charge 25 cents, you charge 50 cents, and you charge a dollar for a kid. What's the difference? She said, well, for a 25 cent kid, you do all the work. For a 50 cent kid, <laughs> you do half the work. And for a dollar kid, brother, all you do is hold on. <laughs> and for drama, for drama tonight, we will present a scene from Elizabeth. The Queen. For novelty, we have Mr. Sam Coslow, a man who has written as many hit songs in the past ten years as any of the great songwriters. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I just wrote a song too. It's dedicated to Major Bowes, entitled "Hey Hey, the Guns All Here." Hey Hey, hey a minute, Victor. I was only kidding. <laughs> For comedy, we have Mr. Irving Cobb. One of the world's leading humorists. And what stories he tells. And the minute that my father, my dad, heard that Irving S. Cobb was coming to South Dakota, you couldn't hold him. He insisted on giving a party for Mr. Cobb. And was the reason for it, too. You see, my father's from the South also. South Los Angeles, Temple Street. <laughs> well, my dad called me up and he said, Son, I'm giving a party for my pal Irving. <laughs> And a party like this you never saw in your life. I'm going to have everybody. Of course, I can't tell a joke on account of the dialect, but I'll try. <laughs> My father said, I'm going to have everybody there. All the big people from the motion pictures and the stage. I'm going to have Jake Warner, Eddie Jessel, Georgie Kenter, Vinnie Jenner, <laughs> Daryl Sheehan, Kate <laughs> Powell, Dick Francis, Ruby Blondell. You see, he says, I know everybody. He says, now listen, son. I'm going to invite over a hundred people. So we'll need about three hundred sandwiches. Now here's what I want you to do. Go to the Reese Hotel and tell them to make you up each different kind of sandwiches. I said, Pop, are you crazy? Do you realize what they'll charge you for three hundred sandwiches at the Ritz? He said, who's asking you? Do as I tell you. Go to the Ritz. Tell them to make you up each different kind of sandwiches. 
Then go to Goldstein Delicatessen store and have copies made. <laughs> That's my father all over. Well, since this is request week, ladies and gentlemen, my opening song is naturally a request number. And really, I'm happy to sing a song because, well, there's quite a little sentiment attached to it as far as I'm concerned. It happens to be one of the first songs I ever wrote. I hope you'll remember it. Avalon. to bring a songwriter who shall to go. And tonight we have a man that to me, well, he's just great. His name, Sam Coslow. A man who has written hundreds of hits. And it might interest you ladies and gentlemen to know that in show business, an artist is invariably remembered for the latest thing he's done. And this includes songwriters, too. If the latest thing a fellow has done is bad, everyone says he's slipping. If the latest thing he's done is good, Everybody says he's great. And Sam Coslow, as far as writing great songs, is really great. His latest song is In the Middle of a Kiss. Oh, you all know that. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to present him tonight at the piano, Sam Coslow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make just one thing clear. I want to understand right here. I positively will not sing a medley. Like all composers you have heard, I give you all my solemn words. I positively will not sing a medley. Now, medleys have become passe, and as a matter of fact, wouldn't it be a screwy way to start a high-class act if I sang, sang all of the love I found in your embrace? I'm thankful, though, I know it's ending all. We were all alone. 
I told you all before, memory of the last people. I positively will not sing a memory. Some writers love to come out and go. Not me. You'll never hear me shout on all my road. It came from the night. The night that we had was like a melody of
Jack Stan and Piggy Downer. Well, last night I took them to a rodeo. And they certainly got a kick out of it. But when it was over, I said, all right, you fool, you're going to take your home. Where'd you live? Well, I lived in a house on the corner of Broadway and Broadway. Well, you see, I had to get out of there. Well, you know, I'm going to have to get out of there. Well, you know, I'm going to have to get out of there. Well, you know, I'm going to have to get out of there. Well, you know, I'm going to have to get out of there. Well, you know, I'm going to have to get out of there. Well, Jack gave me a dirty look and wouldn't even speak to me. So I said to him, what's the matter? He said, what's the idea of taking my girl home? And I said to him, God, Jack, I thought I was doing you a favor. It would have taken you hours to get her home. Jack said, well, what do I care if I walk four or five miles? By the time I got her home, at least she would have kissed me goodnight. Say, when a guy walks four miles for a kiss, brother, that's love. So you know they're going to mean it when they sing this very beautiful love song, I'm Falling in Love. With someone, Jack Stanton and Lady Gardner. For the very same feeling I never felt before, to the kind of life that you first saw. My heart's acting strangely, it feels rather sore. At least it gives me that impression. to show us today sometime, and that's Sheldon Cobb. I doubt if there's another American author whose name is better known in this country, and for that matter, all over the world than Sheldon Cobb of Paducah, Kentucky, sir. I'm proud to see you, sir. I've known him for 15 years, sir, and I'm so delighted to have him here in Chelsea to do tonight, sir, on our own only first program, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the man who tells the story better than anyone else in the world. And also makes the world's finest men do this, sir. Mr. Holden Cobb, sir. Thank you, Al. I take it this is an occasion. You're too modest for something. 
to bring the subject up yourself, but I'm told this is the 10th anniversary of the making of the first great sound picture, <clears throat> The Jazz Singer, in which I'll go to start. All those who are applauding didn't see you in that show. <laughs> Until then, we don't know had two standard forms of theatrical expression, the legitimate play and the movie. In other words, the spoken drama and the unspeakable kind. And you branched out as an amateur. As a, I mean, a pioneer. Well, the American people, I'm proud to say, are great hands to hold a grudge. So I particularly remember that Al Jolson worked in the jazz center long after they had forgotten even the name of the fellow that killed McKinney. I thought I'd, start, sort of thought I'd start off tonight with a few words about our glorious California for the benefit of the tourist trade. You know, I'm practically a native son now. I've, I've been here another year, and I've even started boosting the climate. This is the only country in the world where people stand out in the open air and give three cheers for the climate. They even have climatic cheerleaders. I uh, wish you found the 10,000 of them getting together at an hour of picnic and passing a unanimous resolution endorsing sunset. I have to admit, I was a little shaking in the face last winter. It seemed to rain at times. <laughs> At least we had heavy mist to, to drown people. I, I, was all, I was almost ready to believe that these are the old timers called our state sunny California for the same reason that naturalists call the studied hyena the laughing hyena. Not because he laughs so often, but because he laughs to tell them. <laughs> But it's cleared up since then, and we are now calling attention to our sunlit golden slope. I was down at the beach this afternoon. You wouldn't believe an ocean as lonely as that one could be so crowded. <laughs> well, the mile back there was selling standing room, and, and you had to wait till somebody drowned before you could find the wave. It wasn't being used. Somebody, some accommodating soul finally did drown, thereby creating a vacancy. And I and I jumped in and swam out and turned over on my back and floated. Uh, not, that wasn't successful. Uh, near sighted swimmers kept thinking I was a life raft. And <laughs> came and anchored alongside. And so I, I paddled ashore and stretched in the sand and took a sun bath. And that was an error, too, but... I'm now so well done that all I need before being served is for somebody to stick a piece of parsley behind one ear and put a little sackle in the mouth and, and maybe fix the gravy with a little brown flour. And, and did I just, it, listen, if I had my shirt off, and I wish I did, you'd think I was wearing a necklace a hot water bottle. And you can right now, you can take a little of my skin almost anywhere and I feel for you like a banana. And you'll note my face is just a trifle sunburned, not to say reddish. As a matter of fact, I had to ride backwards coming up from the shore to this studio. So I turned around, I tied up traffic because they said I was a stop treatment. I, I was going to say something else though about the products that are so appreciously and silently advertised here. But I'm totally sure there are people who offend me, and I might add they say me by the teeth or job and not by the word, because if they were, I'd learn to spell it. <laughs> I'm told they know that business well, and I guess we can depend on an authorical giant who slips the clandestine word into these proceedings from time to time to handle that little detail, which is enough makes me think of the little story about the reckless mountain lion. Uh, Al, if you've heard this one, stop me. Just try to stop me. Uh, <laughs> down in my country, a stranger in a great state of excitement rode up to a hillbilly who was flying in the field and said, Say, well, who lives in that cabin yonder? And the constable says, I do for one. Well, he says, is, is anybody in there now? He says, yep, the old woman's in there sitting breakfast. Well, he says, my heavens, the stranger yelled. He said, there's a 
There's a full-grown marble arm just jumped from the kitchen window. Is, is that so? That's it. Martin, uh, but get big guns, man. Uh, aren't you going to do something about it? Who, me? No, sir. But the man lying just has to take care of his chair. Excuse me, Oren, for putting in, but I was kind of hoping you'd be reminded uh, by the last amount of a certain other story by now. Oh, uh, don't worry. Don't worry. Something's always remind me of a story, and if it doesn't, I remind myself. If you ain't interrupted, I was going to put in a few general words for the traveling public about the great West General. The tour is coming this way this summer. I want to mention certain magnificent scenic wonders to be seen and route, including such vast, yawning natural chasms as the Grand Canyon and and Hurlong and. <laughs> And I want to mention our old big trees of California, which are the oldest living things on this earth except some of the wheezes you've heard pulled on this program. <laughs> and still, if you're afraid of a punishment, what's your favorite selection, Mr. Jones? Well, why not uh, the one about the colored preacher down in Alabama? You must have heard me tell that little yarn. No, but my grandpa did. <laughs> Ouch! Well, where did I shake the mouth balls out of it? I, thank you, Mr. Irving Cobb. Yes, sir, thank you. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, well, I can guarantee it's southern flavor. I, I claim this story is as southern as tobacco juice on a southern politician type vest. I, I seem there was a colored man who served the term for horse stealing up in West Virginia. And after he got out, he changed his name and his calling because horse stealing didn't seem to pay as well anymore. And he drifted for the south, and he struck a colored church that was shy of pastor. And, and he preached a trial sermon, uh, and qualified, and was elected to fill the vacancy on the spot. And for about a year, things went along just beautifully. The salary was regular and generous, and parties were frequent, and the sisters of the flock were homely and very sociable. Uh, and but one Sabbath morning, when he entered the pulpit and glanced about him, he saw her sitting in the front pew, looking up at him with a malignant, significant expression on his face, the little black man that had been his soulmate up at mine. And something seemed to tell the Reverend that dark stranger was there for no good purpose. He just had lost men. Blackmail with my eyes. And for just a moment, the parson hesitated. And then out of the sky came inspiration, and he said, In the sing song, she dances of the southern evangelist, colored evangelist, said, Bring me, sister. I was moved this morning to preach to you from the Bible of the prodigal son, which is part of the story in the scripture. And he wanted to pull from his daddy's house and live rough and run around wild and lay down with his home. But in due time, return us to his daddy's home while feast is spread in his arms. But since I entered this house of the Lord this morning, I have changed my mind. Hail of the love I shall address you today from Ezekiel 12 and 14. The 12th chapter and the 14th verse, which it reads to it, namely, his follow. If and thou lookest upon me and seem like my common is familiar to you, if and thou hear the sound of my voice uplifted and seem like the God of uh, some of the ring in your ears, they are saying to you, say nothing to nobody, and I will see you later. Thank you. Well, other than the cops, you didn't listen in last week. I told that story. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, here's a little song I introduced in South Dakota just a few weeks ago. It seems to have left the lower pool because it's quite for a well, it's, it's just been pouring in. So now I'm going to say it for you again. Then it came to this little song 
to my little five-month-old boy who curled up on the in the house. The title is, You Little Mischief Maker. All right, Victor.
Last week at the Coconut Grove, one of the night spots in Hollywood, where the picture stars left to dance, a new entertainer made her debut in the floor show. Well, sir, the next day everybody was talking about this charming young singer. And a lot of people said to me, Al, you've got to get this girl. Her name is Alice Brown, and you must bring her here to show the door. Well, I asked her if she'd come, and she's here tonight. She's pretty, she's smart, and I know that you love her singing, Miss Alice Dawn. Now, we've seen someone ask Alice for the pleasure of the next dance, and here's her answer. actors and actresses that never get a chance to show that they really have great talent. Some of the amateur programs on the radio now are helping to discover this hidden talent. But it still is very hard for dramatic actors and actresses to get any real experience. And so we're very glad to give them a chance here in Shell Chateau. Tonight, we are presenting a young lady whose work in pictures has so far consisted, well, 
just little small bits. But we believe that she has a real future as an actress. We are very happy to present her tonight in a scene from Maxwell Anderson's famous play, Elizabeth the Queen, with Mr. Irving Fisher as Lord Sussex. Ladies and gentlemen, look, I know you're kind and fair. This little lady is nervous, naturally. And I want you to give her a real hand. Miss Margaret Grayson. Oh, that's swell. It's meat and drink to these little women. The scene is the court of Elizabeth, England's most famous queen. Elizabeth is not as young as she was, and she's now facing the greatest tragedy of her career. Because she has condemned to death the man she loved, Lord Essex. Essex has loved Elizabeth, but he's as hard as ambitious as she is herself. And he has attempted to seize the throne of England. For this reason, he has been in prison and now awaits the head act in the power of London. But Elizabeth is still willing to forgive Essex, that he will ask forgiveness. She is only to send her the ring she once gave to him, and she will relent. For her lover is to die at six in the morning. Elizabeth has waited all night for the execution, with her so-called in attendance. It is now almost six, and the ring has not come. Elizabeth, the most powerful monarch in Europe, is at the breaking point. When Lord Cecil arrives on the tower. Lord Essex is prepared for execution. The priest has been sent to him. Mm, no, I say. And now, at once. Go out to me, all of you. All three Penelope. Go quickly, quickly. All. Look here in my face, Penelope. He's so young. And I'm old, I'm old. It comes in my eyes. Here you're so young. You must be here when he comes. You mind. You look so young. Yes, madam. But you. You're beautiful. Beautiful still? No, oh, but I was once. I was. Do not believe it now. Oh, yes. You're always beautiful. You've always been. Thank you, my dear. Go now. Here comes. He's here. I'll go. You sent for me, or so they said. Yes. It would have been kinder to leave me with my thoughts for the axe came down and ended them. You spoil me for death. Are you so set on time? I can't say I care for it. This blood that beats in us has a way of wanting to keep right on. But if one is to die, it's well to go straight toward it. You must have known I never meant you to die. I am under sentence in your majesty's court. There's no appeal that I know of. I am found guilty of treason on good evidence and cannot deny it. This treason, I believe, is punishable with death. God knows I'm proud and bitter, too. This was true with much cause. But I have sent for you. I have taken the first step that way. Oh, do not make me take the next. The next is to the scaffold. It's only a step now, and I've made ready. I, you are bitter too. We have let it go too late. We both waited for the other. But it was I who spread first. Will you make me tell you first how much I've longed for you? Oh, it's hard for me. My dear, you can tell me so gracefully, for you have nothing to gain or lose by me. But I have life and love to gain. And I find it less than fitting to speak like a lover. But you suppose I do it to save my head. It's true that you never loved me, isn't it? You were ambitious and I loved you. And with the nearest way to power, you took the nearest way. Oh, no, no, one moment. This is an hour of truth that was ever true. I'm older than you. But a queen. Oh, it was natural you sat on me, speak me fair, and I believe you. I'm sorry I believe you. I'm sorry for you more than for me. Well, yes, that's true enough. Now may I go? 
This dying sticks in my mind and makes me poor company, I fear. It was cruel. It was cruel, then. If you wish to make me tell you what you well know, how much I used to love you, how much I have longed for you, then well, I will say that's a small victory to win over me now. But take it with the rest. You did love me? Yes. And love me still? Yes, you should know that, I think. You kept my ring. You never kept my ring. Oh, I've been waiting for it. You may have it back if you have used for it. I have thought to wear it as far as my grave. But take it. Oh, I'd have given all that had passed at any hour, day or night since I last saw you. I've waited late at night thinking. Tonight the ring will come. He will never hold out against me so long. But the night went by somehow like the days when it never came. Till the last day came. And here is the last morning the chimes beating out the hours. Yes, I know. But I could not have sent it. Why? If I tried to hold you to a promise you could not keep, and you had refused me, I should have died much more unhappy than I am now. I'd have kept my promise. I'll keep it now. If I offered you this ring... Yes, even now. You would pardon me, set me free, feed back my estates to me, love me as before, give me my place in the state... Oh, if it was. And what would happen to your throne? My throne? Nothing. Yes, for I take it from you. Again? You play that game again? The games one plays are not the games one chooses always. I am still a popular idol of a sort. There are mutterings over my imprisonment even as it is. And if you should set me free and confess your weakness by overlooking treason and setting me up in power once more, the storm that broke last time would be nothing to the storm that would break over you then. As for myself, I played for power and loss. But if I had another chance, I think I'd play and win. Why do you say it? I say it because it's true. I have loved you, love you now, but I know myself. If I were to win you over and take my place as it used to be, it would call me. I have a weakness for being first, wherever I am. I refuse to take pardon from you without warning you of this. And when you know it, Pardon becomes impossible. You do this for me? Why, yes, but not altogether. Partly for England, too. I've lost conceit of myself a little. A life in prison is very quiet. It leads to thinking. You govern England better than I should. I'd leave her in the wars. Make a great name, perhaps, like Henry V, and leave a legacy of death and bloodshed after me. You will leave happiness, something secure. A woman governs better than a man, being a natural coward. A coward rules best. Kill bitter. Perhaps a little. It's a bitter belief to follow, but I believe it. You were right all the time. And now, if you'll pardon me, I have an appointment nearby with a headsman. He comes sharp on the hour. You have an hour, it's about struck five. It's struck five sometimes. Oh, it cannot go this way. Aye, but it has. It has not will. There's no way out. I've thought of it every way. Speak frankly. Could you forgive me and keep your throne? No. Are you ready to give up your crown to me? No, it's all I have. <laughs> Who am I to stand here poking the rebel noble? I am Elizabeth, daughter of a king, the queen of England, and you are my subject. What does it mean you standing here eye to eye with me, your knees? You, whom I made and gave all that you have. You, an upstart, defying me to grant pardon that you should sweep me from power and take my place from me. I tell you, if the Savior's blood ran singing from the heavens for a time that I should hold my hand, you'd die for this. You, pretended to a throne upon which you have no claim. You, pretended to a heart who have been hollow and heartless and faithless to the end. If we met some other how. We might have been happy. But there's been an empire between us. I am to die. Let us say that. Let us begin with that. For then I can tell you that if there'd been no empire, we could have been great lovers. If even now you were not queen and I were not pretender, that God who searches heaven and earth and hell for two who are perfect lovers could end his search with you and me. Remember, 
I am to die. I begin with that. I can tell you truly, out of all the earth that I'm to leave, there's nothing I'm very loath to leave save you. Yet if I live, I'll be your death, or you'll be mine. Give me the ring. No. Give me the ring. I'd rather you kill me than I killed you. It's better for me as it is than that I should live and fatten my fame and fortune on the woman I love. I thought of it all. It's better to die young and unblemished than to live long and rule and rule not well. I, I should know that. Is it not? Yes. Goodbye, then. Oh, then I'm old. I'm old. Oh, I could be young with you. But now I'm old. I know now how it will be without you. The sun will be empty. And circle around this empty earth. And I will be queen of emptiness and death. Oh, why could you not have loved me enough? Give me your love and let me keep as I was. I know not. I only know I could not. I must go. Yes. Go. Look at Take my kingdom. It is yours. Oh, Lord, she's forgiven you. Goodbye, my dear. No, no, she loves you. Go to her. Goodbye. Run to her. She waits you still. If you don't, she waits you still. Oh, dear queen, would you let him go? He goes to his death. Run, run after him. Now, indeed, am I queen of empty and death. And now that Lord Essex is dead... <laughs> I'm going to sing you a little song, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a brand new song. A chap gave it to me last week up at San Bernardino, up at the spring. And it's a request number because he requests me to sing it. The poor fellow, he said if it goes over, he may make a few dollars and keep him from release. It celebrates the courage and spirit of the pioneers who opened up the West. And the song is called Covered Wagon Days, if you please, Victor. Get along, get along, get along, get along. 
Begin to get the savings this balanced gasoline can give you. 